George Teague, Jr. He really doesn't need an introduction. If, if you followed harness racing at all, especially in the last uh, 12 months, you, you know the name George Teague. And uh, one of the greatest horses uh, that I'll ever have the, uh, the privilege of watching race and that's where he's good with. Without further ado, George. Thank you, Chip. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, OHHA for inviting and sponsoring it, and Chip for uh, making a phone call to invite me out. Definitely an honor to come to actually have people want to listen to me. I ain't figured that one out yet. <laughs> Chip thought it was a good idea. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, you guys ain't never been to the jug. You really have missed. Uh, I, I started coming here probably about 12 years ago. Didn't have anything racing there then. But after I come the first time, I made sure that I was going to make an appearance back. So from that point on, I started staking horses to the jug. Fortunate enough to race, I don't have any I raced in it. Uh, close I ever got was a horse win. The elimination a year to rock and roll heaven win. I finished second in the final with a horse named I'm Gorgeous. So if you guys in the school ever get a chance to get a, a little brown jug horse, it is something that is definitely, I've been around and raced in a lot of different spots, but definitely one of the, if not the funnest place I've ever raced, it, it, it is definitely one of the funnest spots you'll ever stop in racing. My son had one, requ one request that he always wanted to win was the Little Brown Jug. So this year we run across Wiggly Jiglet. That was one of the part of the conversations was how we were going to go in it. It was a couple of obstacles to go about. Chip and, and Phil kind of kept me informed <laughs> every time I turned. They were like, you got to race here to get here to, to have a shot to go into the jug. So we kind of made everything work uh, when their entry fee that we didn't pay the early sustainment payments into. And uh, it, it turned out to be one, one special day. So. You guys in this class, I hope you guys stride towards that part of it because it is very well possible. I started just like you guys probably started, the majority of you, with very little uh, chances of ever getting to the stage where I wind up at. But if you try hard enough, invest a little bit, because it didn't take a big investment to wind up with Wiggly Jig. I had to father, I had to mother, I bred them, I got lucky. But I did believe in both the horses. You know, the, the, the father had made a million point four, and the mother had made slightly over 100,000, but she kind of injured herself, and she was showed that she was going to be a good mare, but it's possible to come up with horses like that with not a whole lot to, you know, to invest. Uh, it takes, you, 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 your risk goes away a little bit more if you got a lot more to invest, but it, it still can be done. So um, as much as anything else, Wiggly Jiglet, I don't know if you guys have heard of him or uh, I'm sure a few of you have, um, fun. And I got a 25 year old son that's been driving him for the last two years. I won races with T-Trick and Pierce, and, and I, about 12 years ago, I had a horse of the year named Rainbow Blue. And somebody was telling me that, you know, don't get no better than that, and, and you gotta kinda remember them times because it'll probably never happen again. My, <laughs> I was about 40 years old then, I said, man, I hope I don't die no time soon, because I'd live to be 60 or 70, this is it, I'm in trouble. Because I spent that money pretty quick, so I know that <laughs> that was gonna be something, something very good. So I kinda pounded away, kinda grew, Grew too many, really, because it went up to having moderate stable, 20, 30 horses to having like 120. I wouldn't suggest that to anybody. Don't, don't get too big where it just runs you in the ground and, and just too many headaches dealing with people. Uh, my perception. So, but a little bit about me, but I love answering questions more so than talking. So, Chipper? Questions? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did. I bred back in the, uh, the she, he's got a full sister, his three-year-old. She's all right, no wiggly jiggly. She, she's been bound a little bit of sickness. So I'm hoping she does race a little bit, but she won't make any national attention like he did. And I got a t yearling to break this year by uh, a different sire. So I. Yeah, I said the same thing. Yeah. He raced this Sunday and he, and he put in a very big effort again. I mean, the horse can take air like no horse I've ever had, and, uh, and I'm a little biased again, no horse I've ever seen. So if he stays sound, I hope he can provide a lot of fun and a few dollars along the way, too, because it takes a lot. How much is the stakes payment for the Grand Circuit? On a horse like Wiggly Jiglet to race in the four, this is just a four-year-old because it's fresh on my mind, to keep him eligible, uh, probably about 50000 60000 just to keep him eligible, not paying entry fees. So on the average, you'll write, write a check for like $20,000 just for one horse. So it's, you know, if you're going to play that, you really got to do your math before you start buying too many young ones. 
because too many will definitely uh, break you pretty quick. George, can you explain a little bit about your partial ownership program? You know, at the at the owner seminar in Florida, uh, your your partner uh, Jimmy Bernstein. Positive response on that. Yeah, the positive response. I thought it'd be something real fun to put a horse like that out there for people to have partial ownership. Uh, I, I sold a part of what I had because I own the whole horse. I sold a part in the partnership to, uh, to try to revenue interest for people like yourself that will be interesting in owning. And you do actually own part of the horse. Um, and, a, and a very positive response. Jimmy kind of manages that part. And like the other day, I went out to North Films. A lady come from Michigan uh, with a party of about six people. And the other day, we was back to... Uh, uh, Ch Harris Chester and was 25 people in the winter circle I'd never met before that was part of friends of the partnership. So, you know, it, it, trying to be creative enough to try to revenue a little bit more interest, but I'm not trying to be greedy either because it, it probably cost me more money <laughs> giving, I mean, you know, but selling the partnership than it does giving back. But I, I do like giving back. I do want to have people be interested and what, what, what better way to have people interested in it? If you don't get interested in that kind of horse and own the part, part of something like that there, you know, you're looking at two different angles of the business. Yeah, you know what? Believe it or not, he don't. He 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 requires a lot less than the average horse does. You know, he's quite easy on himself, but it does take a lot of time. I mean, we start breaking. I start breaking mine around September, and they don't really start racing until early July if we're lucky. But it takes a lot of time. But now I raise them. You know, what I mean, I, I inseminate them, which which you know you have to send away for the semen. In my case, I got five stallions, so I try to breed to most of mine. Uh, but still, that comes at a cost. So you inseminate the horse nine months, sometimes they carry over, 11 months, and sometimes they carry over until a year, you know, that you, that you had the folding process, and, and they hang around mom for like six to eight months, and you wean them off, and hopefully within a year later, they break them and, and, and start the ritual of training. Training is the toughest part for me. The other part is just sitting in the field, but you definitely want to still good, good qualities in a horse. And that's one thing I've always been able to be successful with, is doing babies, because I take it very serious. You know, from the day one, my, my philosophy is, you know, I don't train babies, I train racehorses. So I don't go in a baby mentality. Uh, I hope I breed a smart enough horse that it ain't a challenge to break them, and I've been lucky that way. So uh, three components that Wiggly Jiggly got any horse I've never had before have, and I've had some good ones. His lung capacity is out measures any horse I've had by far. And, and the second thing, his speed is ungodly. And the third thing, he's smart. So it's three components to a good horse. If you got a good horse that's real fast and got real speed and, and can go a little ways, if he ain't smart, he's not gonna go as far as he can if he got a brain. So, and I kind of bred them two horses thinking, wishing, and hoping, because I know the father pretty well, that I could get something like that there, and, and, uh, and part of his luck, but part of it was I was trying to match up horses also, because part of it is, you know, like I said again, you guys that are, that are you know, anybody can go out and buy one $100,000 a yearling, but that ain't no guarantee either. You know, my price tag I've always done well with is within the ten thousand range, twenty thousand dollar range, and, uh, and 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 try to keep it down where at the end of it, uh, you try to turn over a profit. And, but you train one for ten months, you gonna have another twenty five thousand into them, because on the average training bill, it'll cost you twenty five hundred a month to train, send it to a trainer, twenty five three thousand a month. I don't want to scare you guys away with that, but you, you should know that part also. If you don't get into the baby part, which I only deal with the babies mostly. Uh, you know, I set up for it that even even Wiggly Jiggly's money, but <laughs> April and May, I'm broker than the guy sitting on the corner and got a place to live. So, because you pay a lot of stake payments, you got to feed a lot of horses, and, and, you, and you hope that, uh, you know, if you start with 10, you want to balance it out, maybe two be good, good enough, a couple is not going to make it, and, and you hope a balance of, and if you start with 10, six of them, seven do make it to the races, that either you can filter through them and, and somebody else could share, you know, your losses on them because you can get rid of them get rid of them, and the other ones you go and hope to make a profit, so. But it could be fun. It could be a lot of fun and very rewarding. I, I train now probably about 25. So I do like raising my own. I got into that, so I have a lot more fun than that. I don't advise everybody to do that. I got a farm. What level do you look at that, you know? I don't, I, you know, I'm gonna be honest, I don't, I don't claim them. It's a different game, I, I don't really, I would suggest people get into that part of it to get business done. Buy yourself a racehorse. 
like I said, 10 months of training one, I, I, I'm not discouraging anybody, but just make sure you do your homework on that part. If you claim one for 10, 15, in Pennsylvania, you go back and race, you'll race for nine, 10, 11,000 dollars, seven, eight, 10 days later. So, but you wanna, you know, they, they all cost the same when you stand them in the stall. I don't care if you paid 15 for them or five. If you bought one for 1,000, you bought one for 100. When you park him in that stall, man, that guy's gonna train to charge you, to, unless he's doing something wrong, he should charge you the same fee from, from, from if he's any type of horse he's gonna be. So invest your money wisely. I wouldn't wanna race for 3,000 if I had enough money to race for 9,000, just you know, paying 15 to 20 claimers. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't claim nothing cheap. I'm sorry? You partner with people? No, I got away from that. That was part of me downsizing. You know, one time I had like 60 different partners. You know what I mean? So a lot of phone calls. Yeah. Now the only person who calls me is my uh, girl that works for me. She called me with the silliest shit, man. <laughs> but, but I'm happy to hear from her. So <laughs> I, I ain't getting bugged by somebody that wants to know why the horse didn't race good. So. But, but it's, nothing, it's good to have owners. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that either. Just something that I got away from. You did in the beginning. Yeah, a partner. I got a couple of partners now. One guy I've been a partner with 20 years, and he, he's a partner that was Rainbow Blue and Southwind Lynx, and we had a good time, and he, he was a neighborhood friend, still is, and uh, he, he's one of my partners today, but everybody, I, I, I downsized, got rid of partners, I started breeding my own, and him and I had a couple together, and, and went to the sales this year and, and bought a few more, and, and uh, he partnered up, and then I got another guy around the neighborhood, same way. I just wanted to downsize, get rid of the phone calls, uh, do what I do, and I got lucky. I got lucky to get wiggly jiggly. So, mm -hmm. I found out. I've claimed some horses. I found out there's usually a lot of times there's something wrong with them. Not necessarily. <laughs> Not necessarily. Claimed, you gotta do your homework, I though. The horse. He come home in my barn. He wouldn't eat. Right. So mm -hmm. I got a guy out. That he was homesick. The chiropractor part of it. Uh huh. And he looked at me in the face and he said his joy got. He looked at me in the face and said, Yeah, he looked at me in his face and he looked at me in his face and he said, And he opened his mouth uh -huh. and the bottom was a three quarter inch or half the three inch off to the side. Well, you're a lucky dude. I've been around. I ain't never had that happen. <laughs> so he the, he I want to borrow that guy for a minute. He looked at me in the face. He popped the back in place and he opened his mouth and then it lined up. And he ate. And then he started eating. Okay. You do good with him? I took him over to the Meadows to race a couple weeks later and the trainer came up to him. You should have seen that horse when he was in the barn. In my barn there, uh -huh. they had the people that had him. They had jugs hanging on them because he wouldn't eat. They tried six different feeds. Yeah, that's a good story. <laughs> and, and that is a good so, story. So you, you, and it worked. Yeah, and it, it worked. The horse went on to make money for you? Sometimes you have to figure him out. Did he make money for you? Pardon? Did he go on to make money for you? Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah. He, well, that's a good he, story. Near the limit, he, he uh, went a 17-5 race over there. Oh, okay. For me. Hmm, that's good. A couple weeks later, he went 54 and 4. Okay. For me. Went for me over there. Good. That's a new one on me. He's a little older now. I don't have him anymore. Oh, okay. He wore out. <laughs> <laughs> huh? From what I've heard over the years when you were buying a lot of young horses mm -hmm. as opposed to breeding them, you were kind of now known for picking out hidden gems or value. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've bought some young horses too, and usually if you're Find a value, you have to make a compromise somewhere, whether it's an older mare, mm -hmm. a stallion that maybe isn't hitting real hard. Um, or, yeah, right. What, what different things would you try to look at to try to uncover a value, you know, instead of paying 70 or 80,000 for a horse that you know, had 10 of 10 things right? You know, where were your compromise? Was it confirmation? Or? You know, I, you're right. That's why, that's why I did compromise with a lot of times confirmation. Because, you know, if one, mm -hmm. one looks correct, and he's buy a hot stallion. You know what I mean? And, and, and it all comes down to trying to turn over profit because I do it for a living. So if you go out and you buy a $100,000 yearling, do a quick math, time you stake him, before you get $1 of your money back, he's got to make 150000 Well, 150000 to $1. So you got to be careful with that because it, it ain't what you spend on. Because it does still, by the time you train him for 10 months, that's babies now, and the time you train him for 10 months and you pay the stake payments and the time you show up to race, 10, 11, and that's, if you're lucky, they race as two-year-olds. You know, percentage of them still might not race as two-year-olds. But I, I was very fortunate because I always come in with one theory. First thing I look at is a different approach. I look at things I could live with first. So he might have towed in a little bit, but he, had a, a, he was a good-looking horse with a nice appearance. He might have been a little bit smaller, but he, he, he stood pretty correct. Uh, I would take a stallion that wasn't as hot and, and 
because, you know, you go to sale now, you try to buy somebody somewhere, it's a joke. You, you can't buy them, you know what I mean, because he's a high stallion. So my thing was I would look for a stallion with a, with a better mare in percentage. You know, if you, a, if you had a mare on the second, third dam, and, and to my thing was this third dam would made 10 of them out of 12, is, and she's already done, but 10 out of 12 made it, that's a good percentage. Then I would go to the second dam. You know, if, if, if it was six, seven of them in the foals, and, and they had to be a world champion, but somebody in the family had to be pretty good. And if they, again, if they made a percentage from six foals and four or five of them made it and a couple of them showed a little bit of speed, I was content with it. Now, gambling that I knew something about the family. And then if, when I went up to the other part, I, I didn't deal with a whole lot of old mares. I kind of gambled the risk taking was mares that was reasonably young, with stallions that were not extremely hot at the time, and they had to have a certain look, look to me. And that's one thing I did do. I didn't go back at the sales and look at them. I, did, I don't look at tapes. I never did that. I went to the sale ring, sat on the, from the time the first horse was sold to the last one sold, and I had a good bladder, and I never moved. <laughs> so that's how I bought my horses. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't go back and study them because I didn't want to see things that I could live with. So quick glance, I could live with it. And that did work out for me more than anything else I did do was not looking and picking them too far apart um, because when you get them back home, like now, ones I'm raising, he might not stand as correct. He might not be as pretty as the one in the sale. But I come to find out I didn't make it just as much as the other horses do. And that's what I found out early on when I was doing it, that, you know, it, it, because he wasn't, as, he wasn't sale prepped as well as one of the other ones. That's one other thing I look for, too, one that was a little bit, he wasn't prepped as well as some sale. I'm telling you right now, you go to the sales, man, they put the glit and glamour on them. And I'm telling you, you, you can have a horse that's near black, he'll bring a fraction more than a, than a lighter bay. So these tricks of it, man, you gotta be careful with. And the pedigree, you'll lose that much more in pedigree because the horse looks pretty. So I used to go down, when I did go around the farms, I used to look at my look, I don't want you to put a brush on him, I just want to see the horse. So, but that was something I had a little bit of a knack for. I didn't want to go there and like I said again, I didn't want to go to pick them apart. Mm. Getting back to Wiggler's good one. Mm -hmm. You aren't raced him once or twice as a two-year-old. <coughs> we all know what, what kind of year he had last year and he's having this year. What's, what's his routine? What's his weekly routine, number one? And number two, uh, if you could talk about your, your team mm -hmm. that you have. Well, I've been fortunate. The guys that work for me have been there for a while. Big Mike that takes care of Wiggler Jiggly. He's, he weighs about 350. And he ain't the easiest horse to take care of either, so he's kind of a little bit of a challenge there. But in the barn, he's a lot better than what you see in the winter circle. Uh, you, you can halfway manage him there, but even in the barn, you ain't somebody to just come up and take care of him. You can take his holder off. Ain't nobody messing with him. So <laughs> getting in the stall sometimes is, is almost fun. But he knows Big Mike, and he likes Clyde. But one thing I did as I slowed down, I didn't want to make them guys nervous. Montreal's driving. So the first couple of times, I liked to have a heart attack when he was racing. I never got nervous racing horses. I raced Rainbow Blue. She won 30 out of 32 starts. Not one day I ever got nervous. This horse here race man from the first day he raced, almost had a heart attack from the first six races. Now, and, I, and I just anticipation because I thought he was that great. And if it was one blunder, I'm thinking, man, I, I you know, just would, it would, it would, it, and it worked out good, but it, I just thought the horse was unbeatable. And wasn't being cocky about it, I wouldn't say it out loud then, I can say it back now, but every time he showed up to race, I just knew somebody was going to race awful good. I don't care what age they were, what kind of horse it was racing up against, the ones I knew that he would have to really not to be on his game to lose a race. So that was one part I had to step away from. So I stopped going to the paddock. So <laughs> I was more nervous than them. I made them nervous. So Clyde's been with me probably about 20 years. Good guy. He, he does a good job. Um, and Montreal being so young, you know, I didn't tell the other guys how to drive. So, you know, I had to reprogram myself a little bit. He said, look, I don't need to coach him. I didn't coach anybody else. So I'm not coaching him. So when he goes to the racetrack, he drives his own race. It ain't no, like you saw in the Kentucky Derby, them three guys sat down, they mapped up this great plan and it worked good on Kentucky Derby Day. We don't do that. There's no pressure on him when he goes out. You, you win, lose, or draw, you drive your race. Just like if it's anybody else, because you're 25 years old, and it makes no difference. Because, you know, I always tell everybody, I have bad drives from anybody, everybody, really. I drove a little bit myself, and that wasn't good either, so I got a, I got a good gauge on what bad drive it was. So I couldn't pick on nobody else's driving. So, but the daily routine of him is pretty simple. He's usually one of the first ones out because, say what you want to, he's somebody that we still think is very special in the barn. So he gets special attention. Um, 
His days consist of he jogs about three miles sometime. He likes to gallop if he ain't got the hobbles on. And uh, he'll probably train depending on the situation he's in anywhere from two to five days out, depending on how much time is in between. And, and I kind of draw up the plan for that part. And up until now, I got a so shoulder surgery about five weeks ago. I've always trained him myself, and, and most time I jogged him. Nobody else ever, never, never sets behind him because, I don't know, kind of feel a little bit more comfortable doing him myself. Um, but he, his routine is like any other horse. But one thing about him I noticed right away, when I trained him, man, he was different. And like I said, I've trained one other horse of the year that was that would blew my mind 12 years ago, and she was the best female horse I've ever seen race. I could train him. He would never get tired. And I would train him against age horses coming down before he raced. As a two-year-old, and I trained him on my track, and I think it was like mile like 57 or 58, and I never asked him to pace none. That was before he raced as a two-year-old. And I had trained horses like somewhere with a rainbow in 59, and she went on to make like a million and a half and uh, lights on, horn blowing. A horse like Easy again, another one, uh, training 59. This horse here training 58, pulling him up, and I trained him against an age horse that had been racing in a mile. It had been pacing around 51 to 52, and I'm pulling him up through the lane. The other horse, he's, he just went by him like he was standing still. But all pro progression, all the way down from the time he got about 220, you can see that he was definitely a little bit, a little bit different than, than the average horse. But the only problem was he stayed sore. So I went down to 220, turned him up for a couple months, brought him back. And that's why I missed a lot of stake races. And Mr. Terry asked me earlier why wouldn't he eligible to the jug because he had stayed sore early on. Uh, that was the biggest challenge. So raced him to qualified him twice. He wasn't bad. Raced him the one time, and he went in 51, and he looked awesome. He turned quite a few heads that day. And uh, then he got sore all over again, so I had to shut him down, hoping that he would outgrow his pain and ailment, but that didn't work. He got back to where he was, and, and you know, and, and, and we just tried to figure out a little bit of time what, what was causing it, and got lucky towards the middle of the season, and we found out something that was causing him to be a little bit off here and threw him off there. And um, so far, knock on something hard, He's staying a lot sounder this year. So, but he's a fun horse to be around. Like I said, un unlike what you see uh, in the winter circle. George, when, at what point in time when uh, Montrell was growing up, did you see an interest and did you encourage him to get into the business, obviously growing up in it, or discourage him? And, and kind of what was his thought process? No, I heard a lot of people say that growing up in the business, I don't want my kid doing it. I was totally different. I wasn't a guy going throwing footballs. I wasn't playing no baseball. I drug his little ass to the barn. So <laughs> his, day, his daycare was the barn. He, he liked it. And I got two girls that, that are, that are uh, a little bit older than him. They didn't take the same interest. But they, they're interested, but they didn't take nowhere near the interest. He liked it right from day one. But when you when you like us, that's the way I was raised up. I was raised up in a barn. I never went to a daycare. You know, I was a little kid running around the barn just to be careful around the horses. He was the same way. You know what I mean? So he was actually raised up literally in the barn. So it wasn't like uh, uh, that was what he did. Now I did try, I'm not gonna lie to you, I did try the little league baseball thing and I tried a little bit of football thing, but you know, he, his interest with horses and, and so were mine. So he would tag along when, and I had some good horses back then. So he used to, we used to travel, we'd fly and we'd go to Canada, see the horses race. And, and back then I would have six, seven, some days I would race 10 horses on a day. Um, so he really got access to, to training and jogging horses at an early age that was real nice horses. But I'll tell you a funny story. One, when he was about eight years old, I might be close to the time anyway, a horse ran away with him. But I'll tell you one thing, even that day, when that horse ran away with him, I was scared that I still get trenches when I think about it, what could have happened. He actually sat up in the bike saying, whoa, <laughs> as he went out of sight. And the horse run, I swear to you, from here to them bushes over there, out of sight. And all he was standing up saying, whoa. He got off the cart like nothing ever happened. Normal kids were saying, I ain't doing that again, not him. Went right back at it, and that's what you see today with, with, with his demeanor. Now, there's something he's better than I am, because when I was driving, somebody shut me out of a hole, somebody put a wheel under me, I want to fight when I come in. So his temperament is totally different than his old man. He's built for it a lot better than I am. But he he's, he's really is a good kid, man, and his interest has been there right from day one. So... I probably I probably cheated him on playing football and baseball <laughs> and basketball. I think he's happy. No, I think he is. So. Uh huh. Does Marshall drive other horses? Yeah, he he catch, he catch drives a little bit when he gets an opportunity. It's hard for any of them. I mean, with the shrinking of racetracks and, and the horse population shrinking, everybody's competing for the drives like anybody else is. Montreal by nature is quiet, so he don't say much. And uh, he picks up drives like tonight. He'll probably drive. 
three or four, and this is less busy night at Harrington. He'll drive 10, some nights 12 at Harrington. So he, he likes driving. You know, he does. But he goes to the barn every day. You know, I roll out of the barn at 5, and uh, he comes in. And I don't try to get him because he, he's working the night while I'm sleeping. So, you know, I, I'll try to shake him up around 6.30 or 7. He comes there and works till about noon. And he loves horses. So if you, you know, he's got a passion for that side as well. He got a couple of brood mares. And uh, he's actually got a couple that he, that he owns. So, you know, he, he got his own way of staying interest. But uh, driving is something that, hey, look, mostly everybody at that age, uh, growing up, uh, racing around horses, one thing you want to be is a driver. You know, I'm not, and nothing gets grooming because I like taking care of horses too, but you know, not everybody is saying, okay, <laughs> I'm going to grow up be a groom. So he was no different than anybody else with that part. But he does, right to the day, he works at it. He works hard. He'll come in, he'll jog 10, 12, or he'll train. Like I say, now my shoulder surgery, he kind of does the things I do uh, because I'm not the guy that sits on the sideline and see horses train. If I'm not sitting there in, in the bike, my philosophy has always been when I had 120. Uh, if I wasn't jogging him, I was on the track seeing every horse jog. So I want to see him move. I want to see him start up. You know what I mean? So he's there now in my, in my eyes, and, 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 and he can tell the guys what I like. So it's kind of good to see your son transition to something that you turn out to be very proud of anyway. Awesome. And he's a great kid. So my, my thing is more proud of him. He's a better person than he is a horse driver. So. Uh huh. Do you work with trotters also? I got a few. They ain't my favorites. Not your favorites? No. But I do. I've been lucky. I won the Hamiltonian Oaks and I won a Breeders' Crown. I won some major trot races. But there you go. I deal with percentages. If I deal with 10 pacing Colts, Phillies, I'd I, I be willing to bet you I can make it to a race of six or seven of them. One or two of them going to be all right. If I deal with 10 trotters, my hair look like yours. <laughs> so so I, I, choose, I choose to take a little bit of a different approach. Especially Phillies. Yeah, yes. But I, I've been lucky to have a, a couple of decent trotters. So, but I, I, I got, my sister likes them better. So she got two, and I think I got two. So, uh-huh. <coughs> it was it was an advantage for him, but it wasn't for me. Like I said again, it'll break your ass doing that. You know, you have for two or three years, and he makes six thousand dollars a two-year-old. You know, what I mean, unless you really got some funds coming in, you can't do that with that many horses. It's all about a matter of economics. You know, what I'm saying, and maybe the game would be better if they if they did start at three. I don't personally think so. I think I found that the ones I had, even though some of them were born in in June, they mature. They're mature enough to start racing in July. So, no, I, I don't think that is, I think individual horses that have problems might need time to mature. And that goes on an individual case. But, no, I, I don't see no, see no big hindrance from horses starting early versus late. Uh, the whole industry is pushing for the two- and three-year-olds Well, that's why you got to get it. Because, like I said again, if you take it from where I come from, you know, you breed them. First of all, you got to send away for semen. And it'll cost you... If you're lucky, a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred. Even, even with mine, I got I got two farms, and I keep some at some one place and some at another place. Um, but in return, it, it's quite expensive to get them in foal. Then you got to sit there and you got to feed them for eleven months, and then you got to fold them out. You know, I got I got, I think it's like eight cameras in, in the barn, my main barn at home, and I take my turns watching the camera too. So there's a lot of sleepless nights between February until right about now. Somebody costs so much, and if you backed it off to three-year-olds, I don't know if everybody can afford to sit there and rest them for another year and then restart them back up and train them. So the percentage of them, you need a percentage of them make it as a two-year-old to make it financially feasible to, to do the young horse thing. I love the young horse thing. It's the only way you dream about getting a good one. Uh, if you claim a 15, he might be a 15. He might step up to a 17.5. Chances are he's not going to be an open pacer. It has happened, but your chances are slim. In order to get a great horse, You've got to actually start with a good one because very rarely anybody runs across and sells the ones. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go sell Wiggly Jiggly, you know what I mean, because I kind of, I was fortunate because I had a, quite a few good horses before him. And when I knew he was the best one that I ever had, and as soon as somebody saw him the race the first time, how much you want for him? And I turned down a big chunk of money for him, uh, even being a gelding, because I still think he could have made what I, and he did make what I was turned down. So... Hey, look, he's tried all your life to get one like that there and, and turn them loose. 
it's kind of a uh, dumb thing if you, if you dream of having one like that, so I won't go sell him for nothing. But in return, it's, like I said again, it's kind of hard to have him hold over too long. Well, I look forward to racing. I look forward to racing the, the one they said they can pay some 45. They got to prove that to me. I'm not selling him. Somebody's selling him. So they say he pays some 45. So I'm, re I'm really looking forward to racing against him. Uh, the Freaky Feet Pete horse, another great horse. He beat us twice. Uh, a, a real good horse. So it kind of makes it fun. I, I'm, I'm more excited because we are race smack in the middle of it because we do own one of the best horses in the country. So it's kind of fun. But he's going to race. He loves racing. He's not one of them horses that will be managed so tight that I'll be careful to, to not run here. I proved that last year that, you know, I don't care if we get eight, always racing. Half mile racetrack, he'll show up to these events and, and he'll, he'll give a big effort. That's the difference in people want to protect the other ones. So. Who's going to do 45? That's what they talk about always be Mickey. I've heard quite a few people say that. So I want to race a 45 pacer. Saying and doing is two different things. Well, if you go on 44, it won't matter. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm not stretching like I don't know. I hope, I hope that's yet to be seen. So, you know, I've seen him doubled up in a few miles, like the mile at Northfield. Montreal stuffed him in the first quarter in 28 seconds. And really, that horse only paced from around the, halfway around the last turn home, and he looked like he was just starting leaving the gate. Yeah, he did. And, and that was a mile in 49 and 4. And like the other day when, when, when he left, but the best thing about him, again, you can set him in a two-hole, he'll gap out from here to you. You think the horse, as much as he can leave, and he seemed like he could be a little rank, he is so intelligent. When you set him, he'll set. So if you can start him up, and, and, and like the other day, when, when he hit the round the last turn, the other horse was, he wasn't getting tired. He was just starting to pace a little bit stronger. He could pace a lot stronger, pace a lot faster. And, and Montreal just led him east to the wire, a mile on 47 and 3, and, and on a track that ain't conducive to speed. So, and he was a little bit rolling in the turns, and turns there are bad uh, because, you know, just the different material that a lot of tracks have. He ain't got the material they got here. You know, I mean, if, if they had that material and the condition of the track uh, uh, up there, it, it would definitely have been a greater mile than what you saw the other day. Does that mean you're going to bring it back here in September? It was an invitation. <laughs> 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 if it's a spot, I would love to. How about the time trial? Yeah, I don't know about that. that ain't, I don't know about that one. But he'll be at a couple different spots. I think he goes down to Kentucky for one start. And um, he's going to make his mark to the race. We need no time trial. No, nah, he, he's got to do it on the, he got to do it on the money end, don't he? He ain't going to make it on the breeding end. <laughs> so, but he's been a lot of fun. By the way, you guys will get to see his dad um, on Saturday. He's yeah, still here, right? he started. Yeah, I went to see him today. Very underrated horse. He he was a real good horse. He had a couple issues uh, when he was racing. His breathing was a little bit of an issue, and you know he he was kind of worn early. You know, but but a tough horse. And that's why I like him as a sire. I thought that he would do what he'd done. And uh, he proved me right. So, and, uh, and I got a couple more back home, pretty confident he's not, that's not going to be the only one that he makes. Okay. Was there something in that pedigree that you just thought would click? Yeah, I own both of them. So, so, I own both of them, so no, I thought it would click. So <laughs> if I had 10 other stallions, I might not have matched them up as well. Like so I look said, smart. Like George says, it's all on the money. <laughs> yeah, it, it, was, it was definitely. No, I, I, liked, I liked the father's side. He was very tough. And, and the mare is by Jenna's Beach Boy. If, if, if you guys know a little bit about that, man, he's at a small amount of broodmare siring, but very, very good. He looked like he's definitely uh, a broodmare sire. And, I, and, I, and that's why I wanted back. I actually had, I had a partner in when I was racing her, me and Clyde owner. And, and, and Jimmy, the guy that put the partnership on her. So we kind of did a little flip flopping and, and, and sold my part out to him. He raced at Vernon, and I think she broke a bone in, in a back coffin joint. And uh, we did a little flopping again, and I brought it back as a broodmare. So. What age? Hmm? What age is the best? Are they four or five, six? Where's their the horse day sound and stuff? Where's I want to like fold sound? again when they're 12 and they do the four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Do it. No, I don't know. They, they say five or six. Um, I do believe they keep growing. You know what I mean? Uh, I've had majority ones I've had. They didn't get any better. You know what I mean? But they wasn't great horses like him. And I had total truth. Great three-year-old. Two-year-old, I think he made like 100 and 
maybe made 120,000. He made a million and a half as a two-year-old, three-year-old. He come back as a four-year-old. He just wasn't that horse. And he come back as a five-year-old. He, he just never got no better. And, and the majority of ones I've had, they didn't, they didn't take that big leap of faith in, from the three to four. They would pace about where they could pace uh, as a three-year-old. So I, I don't know. Maybe they get better. As they start changing hands, I think they get better. And claimer guys are tough. <laughs> Uh -huh. Someone asked earlier what it costs to stay, stay for. Uh-huh. Usually what I've seen you guys do, uh, if you, your son last summer and Brian went out to race in the Ohio Cyrus Series with you know, your Philly, the one of the hundreds we got. Uh -huh. but what does it cost you to ship a horse like him around to all the different venues? Because usually you're sending one person, one mm -hmm. horse, one rig. You know, it's expensive, but but that was part of downsizing. I had one guy that owned 10% of a horse. This would, you know, he owned 10% of a horse, and I sent him a shipping bill from, so I live in Delaware. So Delaware is six hours to the Meadows and three hours to the Meadowlands, and it's only 30 minutes to Dover, but that's the only place it's close to. And he was bitching about the shipping bill. Wait, well, he owned 10% of the horse. So I might have charged you $500 for me, my $70,000 rig with somebody driving it, to go all the way to the Meadows, 12-hour trip, and I charged him maybe $500, and he was bitching because he had paid Fifty dollars. So, and I'm not the guy to sit around like like to listen to that kind of bitching. No, I don't blame you. Especially with a seventy thousand dollar rig that I'm, I'm I'm not making no money off of. But to answer your question, it gets very expensive. You cannot recoup your money from it. As a trainer, people think a trainer. Let me get this straight. I'm gonna say one thing about a trainer. If you if you meet ten of them, got money, I want to meet them. You guys think that them guys make a lot of money? I'm telling you, I live, breathe, and eat it. I have a horse that's got to go to New Bolton Center. Guess who's in that trailer? Truck and trailer. Either guy that works for me or myself. And I'm telling you, when I've done that stuff, man, I cleared 10 to $15 a day. Phone stop, never stop ringing. People think you was ripping them off. People think you're making all this money because you're working for them. And you say, man, it, it, and I'm not trying to, trying to sound a gloom and doom. That's probably what you want to hear. But whenever you get guys to train, don't you think you're making a whole lot of money? They're not. And the guys that want to make a deal for you, poor souls, do them a favor. Don't make no deals. Pay them. Because half of them make the deals, they can't afford to do it, and it's a good way to lose money. You cannot make money. So a lot of trainers do not make money. So when I, when I get a $70,000 rig, put it on the road, hire somebody to do it, and the same guy, on 10%, bitch because I paid a $100 paddock, you know what I mean, got $10 at the end of the paddock. <laughs> this poor soul stayed up wasting two days of his whole day going night to do that. So, but he was assuming that somebody's making too much money off of him. So that was one of my pet peeves, and that's why I had to get away from it. I was thinking more in terms of like a lot of people that get into races and you see in the job horses made three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand dollars this year, and think that you know whoever owns it or trains it's making a lot of money. My point was you know that that yeah, you still make a lot of money if they make econ. You're not familiar with. Yeah, but you know it ain't that many. It ain't that much expenses. But I'm not, that is that is making good money. If you sit there and, and, and like a horse like Wiggly Jiggle on a three year old, and then as they go older, you'll spend fifty plus thousand staking them because it, 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 four year olds are quite more. But you'll spend I think it was like 30,000 to keep them eligible, and probably 45,000 here. I supplement them to a couple other races. I should probably spend another 150 thousand dollars just keeping them paid in. But the horse made two million, so it was it was back to mom and pop doing it. So it wasn't like it was a whole lot of expense there. So it, 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 if if you got a bigger stable, the more bigger the stable you get, the more expense you got. So. Uh huh. Let me tell you something about a horse. If you are in this business, you don't like horses, <laughs> you got to be one of the dope boys. I'm not a dope boy. So if I'm the time I walk up and I like what I do, I wake up 5 o'clock on my own because I like doing what I do. So I, if I ain't jogging, I'm sitting there looking at them go. My, my, every afternoon, i got a bunch of babies. I just love sitting around looking at them. So I'm a horse lover first, believe it or not. My routine is just that. I'm around the barn most of the day. And I'm going to tell you what I used to tell people who work for me. They know. Hey, look. Best way to keep a horse from, from staying away from anything else is keeping a happy horse. So to me, the best pre-race has always been a happy horse. Uh, I don't drug horses. Contrary to what people might assume people do to have a little success, I don't do that. My, my total dedication has always been is keeping a horse happy. So as much as anything else, Wiggler Jiggler does get special attention, but the other ones do too. You know what I mean? Even when we had a bunch of them, if, 
if somebody was ever caught roughing up a horse for any reason at all, you know, it's, it's, it's never allowed because, you know, that's their job to work around them, not to sit there and uh, uh, do things that I do not approve of. So uh, I hope that was, I hope that answered your question. Yes, it did. Thank okay. You. Oh, that was a bad one on him, I can tell you. <laughs> I, can, I can tell you. Well, I would like to take that day back. I, I had downsized with him, and uh, I had 10 babies. And it was just something that was all homebreds. And I'm thinking, well, you know what? It's a lot easier. I can turn them right back out. And I went through one day and cut them all. And he just happened to be in the pack. 10 of them. So it wasn't a good day. <laughs> he, he might have, I don't think it would have made a difference how good he was. Now, he was always the most difficult one to mess with. He wasn't, he wasn't easy. I remember the first day we went to catch him. Everybody still remember that now because how he is. He run, and he, it was six in a field. He run, he run, all five are caught, and it took us another hour to catch him. I should have known right then, shouldn't I? That should have been a little bit of a sign. I didn't listen to it. I still cut him. No, but my decision to cut him, I never, ever cut horses. You know, a lot of guys want to take him to the paddock and stuff. Man, hey, you keep this horse stud. Because most time, the horses are not mean. I mean, they, they might be mouthy, but they're not mean. Unless people make them mean. You tease them, which you're not allowed in my barn. Then you make a horse just you know, being himself. I mean, I'd rather for a horse being himself. So, you know, I've took horses that would be real mouthy, but they never, never try to, unless something really wrong with them, they try to hurt you. But a normal horse, my opinion, I, I don't think you need to be cut. Unless they're just doing right rotten. You know I mean? Like they're balking or throwing themselves down or something like that there. But the average horse, I never cut one. And boy, did I screw it up that one year. <laughs> So, <laughs> so my decision making, I wouldn't follow my tracks too much. I like to have him as a stud. Got time for one more question. Mm -hmm. You mentioned waking up at five in the morning. Mm -hmm. Why is it that horses get trained so early in the morning? I mean, I understand it's in the summer, but what if it's, you know. It's just my routine. The average guy starts around all the way about seven or eight. You know, it's something I'm programmed myself to. I kind of like, I like doing that. But why, why not, especially in the winter, do it at 1 o'clock in the afternoon when it's warmer? I, I don't want to be around that long. <laughs> <laughs> I just bundle up. And the horses don't mind cold weather either. So there ain't no other reason. I, I just got a routine that I like. I like getting, I just got a routine I like getting up early in the morning. Now the help don't like it. They'd rather have it at <laughs> 7 o'clock. You know what I mean? And they kind of drag in at 5.15 or something. But. Uh, uh, no, I just like, I just, sometimes I'm used to it. I'm a little bit old school with that part. So. Well, George, I'd like to thank you very much for coming tonight. No problem.